Space and time and fashion worlds to his design. The one whom angels host revere, hung the stars like chandeliers, numbered every grain of sand, knows the heart of. Forsaken by a traitor's kiss, the curse of sin and centuries did pierce the lowly prince of peace. Oh, lifted high, the sinless man crucified. The
troubles of the world, going home to live with God. Soon we'll be done with the troubles of the world, the world, the troubles of the world, the troubles of the world, the world. Soon we'll be done with the troubles of the world, going home to live with God. No more. No more. Well, good morning, Grace family. The reports of my demise were greatly exaggerated. <laughs> I'm glad to be with you. A couple of things you'll notice in the Grace Weekly, there's a list of the names of potential new members, 50, I think. What, a, what an amazing thing God is doing here at Grace, bringing more and more people to be part of our family. And uh, many of them are new believers, and we're so excited about that. Uh, and also, you probably noticed we have some help doing music this morning. This is the chorale from the Masters University, and uh, we're very thankful for them. Welcome, you guys. We're also going to do something a little different by having the Lord's Supper earlier in our time together, uh, before the sermon. And so I, I just tell you that because it's a, it's a family meal. I, I know that the, one of the great experiences in my life is when all of my kids and their kids are home. Oh, by the way, we had a grandson yesterday. Silas Henry Dickman, yeah. And when everybody's in our home and we're sitting around the table and we have to bring in extra chairs and it's just, there's nothing like it. And that's what the Lord's Supper really is. Imagine if you were invited to whatever you think is the most important place to eat Maybe it's the president, maybe it's, uh, I don't know, Steve Garvey, whoever it is, invites you to dinner, and you can hardly wait. Well, today Jesus invites us all to his meal, and I would love for you to take the time now as we pray and as we sing and as we read the, the word and as you hear the choir to prepare your heart to enter into that meal. I invite you to stand and honor God with the reading of his word. From Psalm 28, we read, Blessed be the Lord, for he has heard the voice of my pleas for mercy. The Lord is my strength and my shield. In him, my heart trusts, and I am helped. My heart exults, and with my song, I give thanks to him. The Lord is the strength of his people. He is the saving refuge of his anointed ones. Oh, save your people and bless your heritage, Lord. Be their shepherd and carry them forever. Lord, we, to you we look as our shepherd, the guardian of our souls. But more than that, you are the merciful shepherd who has called us to yourself. Today you're calling us 
to lean into the very presence of Christ in our lives. Help us to block out the temptations and the distractions that perhaps we've been carrying all week. Help us to just exhale and to know we are where we belong in the family that's brought together in Christ. Now, would you bless our efforts at worship, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, Grace. We're going to begin our time singing to a holy God. He is almighty. He is triune, Father, Son, and Spirit. And he's drawn us together as this family in the person and the work of his son, Jesus. And he's invited us to come into his presence with thanksgiving and with songs of praise. Let's sing to our holy God this morning. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Old story that rescued me, praise to 
that is the good news. That is the story that we can put our trust in because it has at the very center our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy 2.5 says this, For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. Let's read together. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. And so to the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. And now all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's sing of that gospel together. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in Just this, so 
singing with us, you can have a seat today. I'm going to invite the ushers to begin passing out the cups as we approach the Lord's Supper. You know, we call it an ordinance, and that is uh, one of two ordinances that Jesus Christ ordained. That's where ordinance comes from. He's the one who said we should do this. So when we do this, we are obeying a direct command of our Lord. It's not something that, oh, we just happened to show up on the first Sunday. Yeah, you guys can distribute. It'd be great. It's something that we need. It's also a church ordinance. It's not a, a private meal. Uh, it's not like you could take one of these little cups and on the way home open it and eat it in remembrance of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 11, it says, when you come together, it's a communal meal. It's a reminder that all of us are part of something that's so much bigger than ourselves. It's also to be a time of remembrance in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul says, And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he also took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. That means that the main course of the communal meal that we know as the Lord's Supper is Jesus Christ himself. And in our busy world sometimes, uh, we can do all the trappings of faith and never take time to really lean into the fact that God Almighty, God the Son, dwells with us, that we are not our own, we belong to him, and he belongs to us. It's also a faith-strengthening meal. Uh, it's an external sign by which the Lord depicts and bears witness of his goodness toward us in order to support the weakness of our faith. Maybe you've come in today and in the past week you've wondered, does the Lord really know me? Does he really have me in his arms and in his eye? And are, is he really working all things out for my spiritual good? Well, during this supper we are reminded that the saving grace of God is displayed even though it's not dispensed. We already have all the grace we'll ever need. But we go back and forth as to how much of that we really revel in. The bread still remains bread, the juice remains juice, but by faith, it draws into the heart of our Savior, Jesus Christ. It draws us there, rejuvenating our faith as we go. And that means it's also a faith-nourishing meal. In the same way that uh, we eat food to nourish physical life, so also in these moments as we feed on Christ, it strengthens our faith. And now before we partake, let's take some reflection time, more than we usually use, to lean into Jesus.
Father, we long to be perfectly whole. We want you forever to live in our souls. Break down every idol, cast out every foe, and wash us, and we will be whiter than snow. Father, we thank you for our church. We thank you for the church family in Santa Clarita. This morning, we pray your blessing on Robert Cooper, pastor of Berean Baptist Family Fellowship. I count him a dear brother, and them as brothers and sisters with us. Would you favor them, Lord, with your grace? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, let's eat and drink together. Lord, bless us now as we enter into a time of teaching and meditation. May your word fall with great grace and truth on our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. The Apostle Paul writes that as, as often as we take the cup and the bread, we remember the Lord's death until he comes again. Waiting is a part of the Christian life, isn't it? This is what the psalmist has to say from Psalm 62. For God alone, O oh my soul, wait in silence. For my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my salvation and my glory, my mighty rock, my refuge is God. And then the psalmist asks us, this is how we should respond. This is the invitation. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him, for God is a refuge for us. Let's stand together as we respond that God is a rock and a fortress, and we wait for him to return or call us home.
your hearts before him for God is a refuge for us. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat this morning. The father never intended us to try to control our circumstances, to bear the full weight of living in a fallen world, or to know even the future ahead of us, right? We're called again and again to pour out our hearts, to pour out all the struggle to try to control things. All the temptations, all those times of failure, all that anxiety that can crush us and instead trust in him. He will carry that weight with you, knowing that being joined to his yoke is far better, far easier. Can you say amen to that? I hope so. Because there's a true sense, really, of refuge in God, knowing that he knows us. He knows all that we need. All things are under his control, even if it doesn't seem like it at times. It is. So right now, we only see dimly. But one day, we will see all things clearly. And in the meantime, we trust in the Spirit of God to continue to turn our eyes toward the Father and knowing that God has our back and has everything in our lives in control, we can turn toward others. And as I invite our ushers to come forward this morning to receive our offering, this is just another way for God to perfect us as we again, through our giving, express our trust in God that he will provide for us so that we can in turn trust and we can in turn care for others. If you're here with us for the first time today, we really love having you here. We'd love to get to know you, and that's why we have that contact card in the seat pocket in front of you. You can fill that out, put it in the offering plate as it comes by. And we'd also invite you to, to go out to the Engage Center, which is outside, outside in those, between those red pillars there. We have a free gift for you just to say thanks for coming. And again, if you want us to pray for you, there's a prayer card, and that really does work. We will be praying for you. Just fill out what, how, we can, how we can enter into that for you by name. Would you pray with me? Father God, thank you for the work that you are doing in all who join now in providing these gifts. We praise you for what you have provided to each, whether in large or small ways, but we now pray that you would magnify the impact of their giving. And as you do, release us to find the true joy and freedom through giving. Declaring our trust in you and our belief that truly you are enough for us. So lead us to find perfect peace in keeping our eyes on you, helping others. And knowing that one day there will be no more worry, no more struggle, no more anxiety or stress or tears in the light of your glory and grace. And for those young lives leading us in worship this morning, Father, and representing many like them at the university, 
I would pray that you would build into them enduring faith for each day, a deep trust in your constant presence in their life and your constant love that never fails as they pour their hearts out to you each day, all of their concern, all of their striving. Grant them courage to believe in that one day as they look into the very face of Jesus All the hard sacrifice and struggles of learning, of faithfully serving and walking through this life in obedience to the Savior will be worth it all. For I ask it in his name. He is our power. Amen. Jesus, one day you will bind every wound. The former things shall all pass away, no more tears. And one day you'll make sense of it all. Jesus, one day every question resolved and every anxious thought left behind no more fear when we all get to heaven what a day of rejoicing Yeah.
Let me invite you to stand at the reading of God's word as we head to the book of Matthew, chapter 6, verse 19, as Tad Merringer comes up to read for us today. And if you're using the Bible in the pew in front of you, it's going to be on page 811, 811. And if you don't have a Bible today, feel free to take that, that Bible from the pew and consider that a gift from our church family to you today. Good morning, Grace family. It's always good to be with you guys in worship Matthew 6, 19 through 34, follow along as I read. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more worth than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is alive, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Thus reads the word of the living God. You may be seated. Jesus, in Matthew 6, has been teaching on the differences between true righteousness and hypocrisy, and he'll use things like prayer and uh, fasting and giving to the needy as a way to kind of flesh this out. 
And so he'll say, when you give to the needy, are you giving to the needy because it is a direct righteous action um, before God and it pleases him? Or are you doing this action because you want people to think that you're generous, right? And so whether it's prayer, whether it's fasting, whether it's giving, whether it's acts of service, I mean, we could pour a lot into this category, right? Are we doing these things because we know before God it pleases him or are we trying to get the favor of other people? And so in the section that we're going to be in today, uh, Jesus is going to use our wealth and our possessions as a way to reveal this within us. And so keeping in those motivations in these teachings, Jesus is not just addressing the direct action of these practices. Every time he teaches, he unveils the motivation behind them. And he's going to do just that when it comes to wealth. Now, I think it's interesting, and we need to note that Jesus talks about riches, wealth, possessions, more than anyone else in the Bible. And I think one of the reasons for that is because when we are pressed in, when it comes to our wealth, the heart behind our wealth is immediately identified. And so when you take your finances and you put them under the microscope, what you'll see is either what's revealed is that they are a blessing that allows for margin and allows for generosity and allows for blessing and enjoyment, or it could veer towards it's a curse because you hold them as a piece of your identity. Um, Perhaps it holds you in fearful hostage because you'll never have enough. And so as we get into this, again, the motivations behind our money and how we hold our wealth is going to be revealed. And so in the first part of what we're going to be today, Jesus is going to address the supposed security that we get from our riches, from our wealth. And then the latter half, he's going to address the folly of worrying about or having anxiety over not having these possessions. Uh, The first part unfolds quite nicely. We're going to see two treasures or two visions or eyesights and then two masters. We ready? Okay, let's see. Starting in verse 19, Jesus is going to give us the first of the two treasures. Here it is. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Very simply, Jesus gives a prohibition of laying up treasures here on earth. Now, we have to tap the brakes here. We have to pause. We have to have a conversation because there's a way you could put this in a very strict vacuum and make Jesus say something that the Bible is not revealing to us in God's wisdom. Okay, let's just lay some ground rules according to what is revealed in the Bible. Firstly, God never condemns being wealthy in the Bible. We could could point ourselves to uh, dozens of examples. I'll give you two Old Testament examples. You have Abraham, you have Job, wealthy men who please God. So, So God does not condemn having wealth or being wealthy. Secondly, secondly, uh, God does not condemn storing up or saving uh, or investing your money. Okay, so, so uh, this could be life insurance, it could be uh, saving for retirement, it could be saving up for a rainy day, whatever. The Bible is actually going to look upon that with, you know, commendable eye. Using the ant in the book of Proverbs as an example, a commendable example of how to store up for the future and to be wise. Thirdly, the Bible never condemns you enjoying your possessions, Okay, okay, Paul will address this with young Timothy when it comes to uh, dealing with wealth and with money. He's like, no, whether it's, you know, your relationship with your spouse, whether it's food or drink or any of your possessions, God is giving you these material possessions and it is okay to enjoy them. All right, the Bible does not call us into a monkish position where we take a vow of poverty and despise all that we have. And so if you interpret Jesus uh, as, as don't store up treasures here on earth and you put that in a vacuum, you're going to end up very, very frustrated because what will happen is you'll sit there eager to obey going, okay, don't lay up treasures for heaven. Okay, Jesus got it. What's next? What's the amount? Like what's the number I should stay away from? You see, that's what the human heart is going to do. If you hyper-focus on some amount, some threshold, some line that you're supposed to, to focus on, That's what you'll focus on instead of the heart of God. We have to understand the human tendency to become legalists in this. So so what we do is we approach the scriptures or we approach God with what's the checklist, what's the list of rules, right? What are the the laws that I must maintain? And God's approaching you out of a desire for relationship. We want metrics. He wants your heart. See, if you focus on the heart of God when it comes to all of these 
issues that Jesus is addressing here on the Sermon on the Mount, uh, then everything conveys. You hyper-focus on the line and the rule and the checklist, uh, you're, you're going to be like <laughs> sorely uh, uh, kind of depressed and frustrated because there's an infinite number of ways to divide that line and come at that number from a different angle. So it's not about these lists and these rules, and we want to quantify all of this. God moves towards us with the desire for a relationship, and so it's not about that number because we can obviously understand that you could be an unhoused person living on the streets and still have the love of money ruling your heart. Likewise, you could be a billionaire and be completely free of being enslaved by wealth. And so now, here are the principles that the Bible gives us to avoid when it comes to money. Here are the principles. The Bible condemns the desire for wealth for the sake of wealth. Okay, so this gratuitous desire for wealth, the Bible is going to condemn. Secondly, the Bible will also condemn the misuse of wealth. All right, so so that's abundantly clear in the scriptures. We could go to many places in the Proverbs. The one that stands out the most to me is what Paul tells young Timothy in his letter to him about for him personally, but also as he oversees the congregation God has given him. First Timothy chapter six, six through 10, listen to this. Paul says this, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. And so the Bible's clear, though. That's the first treasure. Don't do that. Don't put your hope and your trust and your identity and your devotion to these things. But here's the second treasure, verses 20 through 21. But do lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth and rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, what is the underlying assumption that Jesus is making here? What's the underlying assumption? That you're going to be storing up somewhere. There's no neutral. You're storing up somewhere. You're going to be focused somewhere. You're going to be working toward something. And Jesus will do this other places near the end of the Sermon on the Mount. We'll get there uh, at, at a later time. But Jesus will say this in verse 24. Everyone that, who then hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. That's in chapter 7, verse 24. And then in verse 26, he'll say, everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. Now, what's in common there? Both men are building. All right, the difference is, is the, the structure of the house and the foundation and the fate of the home that they're building. And so we get to the end of, we'll get that to the end of Matthew 7. But you see the same thing. Every day you are building something. Every day you are storing up for something. You are working towards some end. And Jesus' underlying assumption is that you'll be doing this. And he is calling us, challenging us to be wise in what we do. Be wise in how you store up. Be wise on what you focus on. Be wise in your investments. And what's beautiful about Jesus' teaching style is he doesn't just give you the principle or the command. He could. He's the Lord God. He could say, just do this. He gives you the principle or the command, and then he follows it up with reasons, right? And so what are his underlying reasons that he gives us here? It's it's pretty accessible. Well, the first reason is the impermanence of earthly possessions, right? In the end, everything in life, the second law of thermodynamics is going to have its way, right? It it could either be tarnished, it could be rot, it it, it could be stolen, it will degrade, right? It'll look worse in 10 years than it does now. We we understand this. And people say, well, what about gold? Gold is imperishable. It's not exactly true, but Jesus' point there is that could be stolen. So either way, material things of this life that people put so much value in are impermanent, What's the other reason that's seen here? It's very simple. The permanence of heavenly treasures, right? Incorruptibility is what actually defines heaven here. 
And so when it comes to this, anything you commit to heaven, anything you cast up to God will last forever. But again, the issue here is your heart. It's your heart. Now, we've been, if we've been paying attention to the Sermon on the Mount, we understand that this is what God is yearning for, your heart. So what has he created you for? A heart of worship. That's why he ends that section in verse 21 saying, where your treasure is, is where your heart will also be. Now think about this. What you value most becomes a matter of what you think about the most. Yeah? You value your spouse. You value your family. You value your grandchildren. You value your children, your house, your job. You value lots of things. And so you think on these things. But what you value the most is what you will be thinking about the most. Because Jesus is saying, that's where I want to target. That's where I want to address what's in the heart. Because where your treasure is, that's where that's going to be as well. Now remember, biblically speaking, your heart is not that organ that pumps blood throughout your body. Biblically speaking, that's, that's not what we're talking about here. The spiritual understanding of the heart, that's the internal part of you that thinks, that feels, that has a will, that plans. Wherever your treasure is, that part of you will be consumed by it. And Jesus is saying that's the real issue here. And materialism or anxiety about materials that we possess can take over our heart very easily and crowd out God and take our trust off of him and on to what money and wealth can do for us, take our focus off of him and what he provides in his providence and put us behind the steering wheel because we have to be in control of things as if we were God. And just like that, we're back in the garden under a tree being tempted to be like God. Indeed, the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil because it gets us into this thinking that it's all about what we can accumulate and what we can control. Now, you might be wondering, well, how do I know if that's the focus of my heart? How do I know if that's where I'm leaning? I mean, that, that, that takes a lot of hyper focus and, and self-awareness. Well, Jesus is going to give you this insight. Look at what he says next. Here he's going to address two eyesights. Okay, verse 22. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eye is healthy or or single, or single, okay, that's probably a better translation, then your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light is in you is dark, is darkness, how great is that darkness? So Jesus is not saying that the eye is the source of light for our body. He's rather describing the eye as the light bringer, okay? It's the guide for our entire life. And so it depends on, we obviously need light in order to steer and guide the body, right? So we have light and the eye, if it's good, it gives us the necessary information to utilize the light, make use of it, and to make the right body movements and the right physical judgments. And Jesus is saying, if your eye is good, Again, a better translation is if your eye is single, if it's something you can focus on, you have a focus, a concentration, then your life will benefit from that concentration. But if your eye is bad in that it cannot focus on what it sees, no matter the brightness of the sun, not much will be gained. So what are we to focus on? Right? So we're, we're, we're avoiding storing up treasures here on earth and putting all of our trust and all of our identity, and all of our hopes and dreams in what we can build up here on earth, how do we make sure that we're storing up treasures in heaven? Jesus is like, well, what are you looking at? What are you focusing on? What's the direction of your heart? Now, what ties this up is near the end of today's message, the end of this passage, in verse 33, Jesus will say, this ties up the entire teaching, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Okay? Now, so seeking God's kingdom and his righteousness, that the ongoing, diligent pursuit of his righteousness and his kingdom is what we focus on for those of us who follow Jesus. That's what we are targeted on. And isn't it amazing how the proper focus, the proper concentration, 
how that can just align and give new perspective in life. Consider this. You have two astronauts from opposing countries meeting up at the International Space Station, right? These, these respective countries are in generational, generational tension, okay? And they're no more than two clicks away from all-out war. And so these two astronauts meet together, they look out the same window, and they take in the blue marbled planet. What happens in that moment? Everything seems to fade away. From their perspective, there are no lines drawn, there are no borders between nations, and the tensions and the issues between their two countries simply seem to fade away. And all they have to do to get there is look out the window and see it. Seeing it, simply seeing it, relativizes and puts to the right priority all of these things. Seek first his kingdom, and then everything will find the rightful place. If we look down here on earth, that which is under the sun, and we put them above the throne of God, then your life is a mess because you're on the throne. Seek first his kingdom, and that will inform how you love your children, how you approach your neighbor, how you go on vacation, how you shop for groceries, how you spend your money. It will relativize and put to right priority all of life. But you have to be able to see it. You have to be looking at the right window. And that's what Jesus is saying. I'm after your heart. You're, you're, you're looking for the, 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 the checklist. You're looking for the rule book. You're, you're trying to to do what only I can accomplish in you. Seek first the kingdom. In other words, look to me. Everything else will make sense. And he's saying the problem is materialism because it creeps in. Jesus gives us this in Matthew 13. It's the parable of the seed in the soils. It says this, listen. The one who received the seed that fell among the thorns is the man who hears the word, but the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke it making it unfruitful. And so the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it out and it's not fruitful. I don't look, I don't know much about gardening other than I can kill anything. I once tried to care for a cactus and in my attempt to love it and to nurture it, I killed it. I don't even know how that works. I used to think that you weed your garden to make it look nice. False. You weed your garden right? Because the, the weeds will take up all the nutrients and all the water and take it away from the plants. So look, in this parable, the thorns grow up, they choke it out, they block out the sun, and the thorns, they get bigger and bigger. The sun can't get through, the nutrients can't get through. So the cares of this life, the deceitfulness of riches, it's choking it out. Why? Well, because you turn and you started putting your resources towards something that is not the kingdom of heaven, so you're wasting your life. So Jesus is saying, you have to have a single focus. You have to look in the right place. You want that to kind of uh, focus your attention on teaching my teenage daughter how to drive. I'm like, baby, look, where your eyes going to be is where that car is going to go. So you're looking at the light post. You're looking at the parked cars on the curb. That you're going to start veering in that direction. Look where you want to go. We all know this. You have to be looking in the right place. And then Jesus is going to get to kind of the apex of this section. So we've talked about two treasures. We've talked about two eyesights or visions. Now he's going to say, look, it comes down to two masters. It's quite binary here. Look at verse 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Listen, you know what he's telling you? You have to choose. Do you know why? Because... Both God and money will force the choice upon you. God is a jealous God, and he's going to push out everything in your life that is not him. Also, money is a jealous God, and it will distract you away from the things of God and the kingdom of heaven. You have to choose. And so the issue, again, it comes down to the heart. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. There again is the re reminder of verse 33 that says, 
What? Seek first the kingdom of heaven and all these things will be given unto you. Keep in mind, only one of these masters carries that as a promise. So if you seek after the things of God, you seek after Christ, then what? What's the promise? He's the, it's the only master that carries the promise. These things will be added unto you. You make money and wealth and, and material possessions your God, it will enslave you. Why? You know this. Because it will never be enough. People will never be enough. You'll need their accolade. You'll need their opinion. You'll need them to look to you, to think a certain way about you. You'll need the material possessions to feel worthy, to feel secure, to feel like you, you're allowed entrance into the room or into the circle of conversation or into you know, a, a social environment. You're looking to the wrong God. It can't add anything unto you because it will take everything from you. Rob you completely of joy. And so in this first section, again, Jesus has been talking about the supposed security we get from these things when we wrongly focus on them. But now in this next section, Jesus is going to turn and talk about the worry or the folly of uh, having kind of uh, these possessions or worrying about not having them. Now, before we get into this next section, let's understand something about anxiety, okay? That's the word that's used here. The Bible is going to assume that we have it from time to time, some more than others for sure. The Bible is going to assume that it's going to be a part of the human experience. The issue is what we do with it. What do you do with your worry? What do you do with your fears? What do you do with your anxieties? Well, we're told in 1 Peter 5, 7, what we do, we're able to cast them upon the Lord because he cares for us. So the question is, how do you know if what Jesus is talking about here applies to you? I mean, can we not agree that there is on a spectrum, there is like concern and reasonable worry on one side, and then there is like fear and anxiety that can be paralyzing and overtake you? I mean, in some ways, being concerned, like my son was out with friends the other night, you know, it's past nine o'clock, and I'm, I'm just concerned. That, that, that's a reflection or expression of my love for my, my kids. We all have that in our life it, where it's reasonable, and it makes sense. Why? Because we're limited. We don't know everything. We don't dance on the stage of omniscience. And so, yeah, in our limited knowledge and our limited grasp of, of what is going on, yeah, we, we, we worry. It's reasonable, right? Not all fear is, ba- is bad if it forces us to run to the right places. Where it might get out of hand is what Jesus is going to address here. So the question is, how do I know? How do I know if my life is veering towards sinful worry, sinful anxiety? Well, let's establish some kind of goalposts, as it were. All right? Sinful worry is when it leads us to disobey. So anxiety becomes sinful when it causes us to disobey God. Scenario. Church member Charlie, sorry if your name is Charlie, I'm just going to use you as a type here. Church member Charlie works a high stress job. The environment is cutthroat, sometimes toxic, and the temptation to cut corners and mess with numbers is ever present. Church member Charlie needs the job, he can't afford to be laid off again, and so every day going to work is another battle with stress and anxiety. So every, every day, Church member Charlie is faced with an opportunity to give in to the stress and the anxiety and work unethically to stay ahead. Or he can cast his fears on the Lord who cares for him and work according to the economy of God's kingdom, accepting whatever earthly outcome. You see the difference? Okay. Now, I'm not trying to be overly simplistic. I understand that life is complicated. But it's really is what you do with this anxiety. It's what you do with these fears, these worries. The, the other marker to be aware of, that it might be veering towards sin if you're constantly living antithetically to reason. Okay, to reason. Now, here, we really get to the meat of the whole issue. Again, Christ our King could simply say, do this. Here's the command. Here's the principle. Go and do it. He certainly can do it. We understand this as parents, right? 
And sometimes we have to tell the little ones, because I'm dad, that's why. Or because I'm mom, that's why. But, but then we also see the benefit at times, many times, we have to, because they're not always going to be under our, our roof. They're not always going to be under our, our, our perspective. And so we have to give them reasons so they know how to live outside of our domain. And so we give them reasons. Here's why this is harmful. Here's why it's best if you do this or that. Jesus, being very tender, just a perfect teacher, will give us reasons and so he brings us along. And we look, we really do need to understand reason, right? Jesus, as it were, is going to use reason to kind of talk us out of our anxieties. Really, Matthew 6, 25 through 34, is an exercise of logic. He's talking about our thinking process. Remember, what are you thinking about? What's on your mind? What's your perspective? And I'll show you what I mean. The, the basic underlying assumption is the idea that worry can't be defeated by reason. That's what we default to. Jesus is coming from an, a rather different perspective because we, we take worry and anxiety, we make it all about emotion. And Jesus is like, no, 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 I want to address your mind because I, I want you to think on these things, focus on these things, have a single focus on these things and walk yourself through the worry, through the anxiety. And Jesus is going to say, listen, Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 that we've been given the mind of Christ. Once we walk or are received into his life, we're given his mind. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul says that's where we're able to take every thought captive. We're able to make our mind obedient to Christ. So how does God argue, how does Christ argue us or reason with us through anxiety? He does it and he uses logic. Any of you who have studied reason, you know what he's doing here. He's using an a fortiori argument. It's an argument from greater to less than. So if this is true, how much more than is this true? Right? Little kids know this all the time. They, 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 you, you see it working through their, 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 their little perspective. They see dad pick up a 100-pound bag of cement, hoist it over his shoulder, and the little kid reasons, oh, if dad can take that 100-pound bag of cement and throw it over his shoulder, how much more could dad just hoist me up and put me on his shoulders? All right, so it, it's, a, it's a greater, if this then, then how much greater than that, right? And Jesus does this frequently. We'll see it in Matthew 7, verse 11. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, you'll give him a snake. If you then who are evil know how to give good gift, gifts to your children, how much more your father in heaven who loves you is he able to provide for you? I mean, can you imagine God saying, okay, I'll give you my son, but I'm not going to give you enough to reason through your worry and anxiety? That doesn't make any sense. And he's going to work it here in this passage. And he's going to give us three examples, three appeals to reason. Now understand, this is a general principle. This is a general command. Many of us deal with anxiety in different ways. Again, what is it? It's about what you do with that. It's not that you struggle with it is the issue. It's what you do with that. Some of you, you're dealing with that differently. That's a different journey for you. But the fact that you're dealing with it, you're talking about it, you're pursuing wise counsel, you're looking to the word of God, and it doesn't seem like you're going to get out of that journey, but you're just doing it faithfully, that is, that, that is doing the work. You should be commended. You should be encouraged. Here are the reasons Jesus is going to give us. It's very accessible. It's very obvious. Verse 25 the first appeal from reason. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothing? You see the argument there? That's the first appeal to reason. The body is greater than food and clothing. This is how it works. God gave you a body, and your body was created with certain physical needs. The cells inside your body need nourishment constantly. And don't you think God knows that? He created the body. Now, if God gave you the bigger, which is the body, the greater gift, will he not also feed and clothe the body? You see, that's how logic works. Where's the second appeal of reason? Well, God's children are greater than the birds. Verse 26 through 27, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more value than they? And which of you, being anxious, can add a single hour to the span of his life? We'll get back to the birds at a later time. Third appeal from reason, God's children are greater than wildflowers. Verse 28, 
And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you who have so little faith? If God takes care of the flowers, how much more will he take care of you? We'll talk about the lilies here in a few minutes. Thirdly, worry or anxiety might turn sinful when it works against faith. When it works against your faith. You'll notice the appeal here to faith. Where he says, oh you of little faith. In effect he's saying, where is your faith? It's interesting that we would expect faith and reason to be opposed. No, no, no. Faith and reason are in a dance all throughout the scriptures. Faith and reason are holding hands all throughout the Bible. You have dozens of examples of this. You think of Hebrews 11, what it's revealed there about Abraham. God calls Abraham to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. And what are we told here in Hebrews 11, verse 19? It says that Abraham reasoned that God could raise him from the dead. So he reasoned it out. In faith, he was committed to the action, but he reasoned, okay, well, if this, then that. If this is true, then this must be true. And so his faith then took that action and began to be committed to its end until God intervened. But that's how faith and reason works. So so you sit down and you think, you ponder, you're focused on the right thing, you're looking out the right window, as it were, right? And you're like, okay, no, there is a God. He loves me, he's patient, he is kind, he's a loving father. And all the things that the Bible tells me about him, okay, you're reasoning, aren't you? And then what does faith do? Faith then just stretches that out, takes it downstream, applies it different places. What do you act? You're interacting with your mind and your heart, your, your intellect, and the seat of your emotions are, are aligned as they're governed by Scripture. That's the dance, using reason. And so sinful worry becomes manifest when it works against that faith, interacting with what we think through. Now, you have little faith. That phrase happens four times in the Gospel of Matthew. It happens here, but it also happens in Matthew chapter 8, right? Jesus is in the middle of a storm with his disciples. Waves are tossing and turning. They think they're going to drown. They cry out to Jesus, Jesus, save, save us. Are you going to allow us to drown? And Jesus, of course, we remember the story, stands up from rest and he rebukes the wind and the waves. And he looks at his disciples who knew what they were doing. They're fishermen. They weren't novice. They knew what they were doing. He says, where's your faith? You have little faith. Matthew 14, verse 31 says, immediately Jesus reached out to him and caught him. Who are we talking about? Peter. Right? Jesus is walking on the water. Peter, join me. Peter does. He obeys. He's focused on the right thing. He steps out. He's standing on water. What happened with his focus? It got lost. The cares of this world, the distraction of that which was around him caused him to lose focus and he begins to. Well, so how does faith and reason interact in that in that interaction, in that story. Well, it's, it's quite simple. If Jesus was in the waves floundering, like he himself was drowning, and he's like, Peter, come on in. That, that, no, re, the reason would inform you, uh, I don't think that's the move of faith I'm going to take. But reason informed the faith. Look at Jesus. He's standing on the water. He invited you out. You do it. Reason and faith. Matthew 18, or Matthew 16, the disciples went across the lake. They forgot to bring bread. You're like, well, what's the big deal? Look, in that world, there's no grocery store. You forget to bring bread or bring fruit, food. You just don't eat. And so they begin to kind of like, you know, the phenomenon is usually shifting the blame somewhere. You forgot. Well, you forgot to tell me. Well, you, come on now. And so they're bickering, and Jesus stands up, and he gives them an instruction on the leaven of the Pharisees and the dangers in that. And what does he say? You have little faith. I just fed how many thousands of people? And you're worried about... <laughs> God, I can speak bread into this realm. Oh, you have little faith. Again, what, 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 what about their knowledge informed the reason to come alongside their faith? Well, the signs, the miracles, the verifications. So when it comes to your anxiety, your worry, 
The Bible is going to assume that you have it. What's the issue? What you do with it. Where it goes. Jesus is inviting you to use your mind. To inform your faith. To put your trust in him. It's a dance, isn't it? Yeah. Slow down. Process. Focus in the right places. And keep going. And then I I told you I wanted to return back to the birds. Because we, we, we tend to think, look, how do I have more faith? We're going to return to the birds and the lilies here in a minute. How do I have more faith? How do I increase my faith? The disciples asked Jesus this in Luke 17. He said, Lord, increase our faith. And Jesus said, increase your faith. I tell you the truth. If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to the mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will be done. Jesus is saying it's not about a matter of amount. Again, we're we're focused on the line, the number, the list, the amounts. It's about taking the faith you have and applying it to specific situations under question. So that's the issue. Ultimately, faith comes from the word of God. So you immerse your mind in the scriptures. You're, You're looking out the right window You're getting God's perspective. And when you gain his perspective and you seek his kingdom and his righteousness first, what happens? Everything is then added unto you and put to the right priority. It just slows everything down, doesn't it? It's not not about an amount. It's about, no, faithfully apply it where it needs to be applied. From his word, you'll understand his plans. You'll understand his provisions. And your anxiety will decrease. You're putting it in the lap of God. You begin to trust him more and see faith increase over time. But here, here, here where we're going to bring in the, the lilies and the birds, the final aspect of faith is that we are to take our proper place in the universe. I thought long and hard about this one. When Jesus said, look at the birds of the air. When they fly through the air, they're doing exactly what they're created to do. They fly through the heavens. That is their function. You look at the lilies of the field. They are growing, they are prospering under the light of the sun, under the water of rain. According to Genesis, we see in creation, they are where they're supposed to be. Where are we supposed to be? Well, I think it's obvious if you're paying attention to what Jesus is teaching here on the Sermon on the Mount, the kingdom of God. We're citizens of that kingdom. We are the apex of creation. We are followers of Christ. We are at the highest level of creation. So it says here in verse 34, therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Not only do we understand our place in all of creation, we are his image bearers, and those of us who are now called by Christ, we, we, are, we are the sons and daughters of God, but it also reminds us of our place within time. What we tend to do is get outside of our lane, like we're focused on, so we think this way, right? I have concerns for today. You know what? I bet you I have the shoulders to carry the concerns I have about tomorrow, the worries about tomorrow. In fact, I'm really creative. Uh, I could go out five years. I could go out 10 years and just take it all. Just think about all the, the things that would worry me and, and drive me to despair. And Jesus is going to say, slow down. Where's your lane? What's the space you occupy? What's your place? Be present. Be present. You're here today. You can only handle today. God is giving you the worries and the cares of this world for today to address in faith. And how you do it? You focus on the right thing. You look out the right window. You put on the right lens. You look to the right person. You put your, your hope and your trust there. And then contentment will follow. Right away? No, you look, th- this is going to be a journey. We're all doing this together. Th- this doesn't happen like that. God is kind. He understands this about you. Be patient with the processes that God has called us to walk in obedience. And so then lastly, when it comes to worry and anxiety, it might veer towards sinfulness when it works against fruitfulness. So if there's fruitless manifesting your life, there might be sinful worry there. Look what Jesus says in verses 31 through 32. Therefore, do not be anxious saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. 
In other words, we're supposed to be living at a higher level. Those who don't know God chase after these things as if they are God. But we are called to live life at a different level. You're called up out of that. Let God take care of that stuff. Seek first his kingdom. Seek first his righteousness. That's what we should be living for. Not the everyday material stuff that's going to decay, that's going to disappear. You have a higher calling, a higher purpose. Remember Paul says, Philippians 3, verse 19, he says this. For those who don't know God, look, their God is their stomach. They do everything they can to provide for their own physical needs. Their glories and their shame, their mind is on earthly things, but your citizenship is where? In heaven. You should be higher than that at a different level. We are to live for God's kingdom and his righteousness. Seek first the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, and his righteousness, and what? All these things will be given to you as well. Seek means to earnestly work for it. Hunger for it, thirst for it. The part of your brain, the part of your being that was given to seeking, to imagination, to thinking, to reasoning, to planning, and working. All of that gets hijacked by anxiety and used for something else. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 take it back. Take it back in faith and focus on me. I'm going to give some time here to focus and to ponder these things and to maybe before God ask that question of ourselves, where are we not trusting? Where are we not content? What is choking out our vision of the kingdom of heaven and Christ on the throne? Give us some time to think on that and we'll close our time in prayer. Father, how easy it is for us to get outside of the perspective or the rut of our perspective and to think wrongly and to believe wrongly and to be overwhelmed with the cares and the concerns of this world. How easy is it for us to hyper-focus on things that ultimately will not satisfy? We're thankful for the words of Jesus here that quells and calms the emotions that can very easily betray us. Lord, thank you for giving us the perspective of heaven. Thank you for the light of the truth of your word. Lord, we pray that that would make us wise in how to live and how to function and how to operate as brothers and sisters, as sons and daughters, as neighbors, as friends, as spouses. Lord, thank you for the grace that called us into citizenship in heaven. Thank you for the faith to reach for that grace. Lord, we ask for more of it. We ask for uh, more wisdom in knowing how to live and to be citizens of the kingdom. We're thankful for the victorious Christ as we're still celebrating what what we were celebrating last weekend, the resurrection a new way to live, a new perspective. Lord, we're thankful for all that we have because of him. It is in Jesus' name we pray in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thanks, brother. We appreciate you bringing the word today, reminding us where our eyes should be on the Lord and his kingdom, rather than wealth, rather than worry. We're also reminded that these are regular Occurrences in the human experience that we worry at times, we are anxious, and yet the Word of God does speak to these things. Occasionally here at the church, we will have a seminar on a particular issue, uh, a counseling issue, uh, something of the heart that we can discuss 
uh, and address from the Word of God. We have in the past looked at the issue of depression. We've looked at the issue of anxiety. Uh, and in two weeks' time, we are going to have a seminar on grief. And we recognize this is a particular area of suffering uh, where uh, for our own sanctification, it would be helpful for us to learn from God's Word how to address grief, or perhaps even as we minister to our loved ones who are experiencing grief. This might be of benefit to you. We would invite you to attend that course. Uh, that seminar will be in two weeks' time on the 21st uh, across the way in the TSC during second service. And then that same Sunday, in two weeks' time, right after the conclusion of our second service, we are going to have an informational meeting for those who are interested uh, on going uh, across the globe with Pastor Aaron Miller to do a church history tour in England and Scotland. And so if that is of interest to you, you can come to that informational meeting in two weeks' time, uh, right at the conclusion of our service. I recognize that as we're doing a, a discussion today of God's word through Matthew, that perhaps there are some here who not only uh, are impacted by this message on how to rightly handle and consider wealth and worry, but perhaps you're also for the first time wondering who Jesus really is. Uh, if you have questions, we would love to speak with you about our Savior, or perhaps this morning you're here with a burden and you would like to receive prayer. It would be our joy to pray with you. And so at the conclusion of this service, there's going to be some pastors and elders just to the left of the stage, my left, your right. Uh, and we would love to meet with you and talk with you and pray with you. With that, would you stand to receive our benediction this morning, which comes from the 13th chapter in the book of Hebrews. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Grace to you.